From the Conference Center at Temple Square in Salt Lake City, this is the Saturday afternoon session of the 189th Semi-Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, with speakers selected from the general authorities and general officers of the church. The music for this session is provided by a combined choir of individuals residing in stakes in the Provo, Utah area. This broadcast is furnished as a public service by Bonneville Distribution. Any reproduction, recording, transcription, or other use of this program without written consent is prohibited. President Dallin H. Oaks, first counselor in the first presidency of the church, will conduct this session. Brothers and sisters, we welcome you to the Saturday afternoon session of the 189th Semiannual General Conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. President Russell M. Nelson, who presides at the conference, has asked that I conduct this session. We extend our greetings to all who are in attendance or who are participating by means of television, radio, or the internet. We likewise welcome those who are viewing the proceedings in stake centers in various parts of the world where the conference is being carried by satellite transmission. The music for this session will be provided by a combined choir of individuals residing in stakes in the Provo, Utah area under the direction of Jim Kaysen with Joseph Peebles at the organ. The choir will open this meeting by singing, The Lord is My Light. The invocation will then be offered by Elder Matthew L. Carpenter of the Seventy.
Our beloved Heavenly Father, we love Thee, and we love Thy Son, our Redeemer. We thank Thee for that magnificent music, for the angels that we feel are here. We are grateful to be gathered for this session of conference. Heavenly Father, we ask that the Holy Ghost will be here in abundance, that those who will speak to us and all of us who will listen may have messages of eternal truth sink deep into our hearts, that we may be better followers of Thee and Thy Son. This is the desire of our hearts. We ask for it in the name of Thy Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. President Henry B. Eyring will now present the General Authorities, Area 70s, and General Officers of the Church for sustaining vote. Brothers and sisters, it is proposed that we sustain Russell Marion Nelson as prophet, seer, and revelator, and president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Dallin Harris Oaks as first counselor in the first presidency, and Henry Banyan Eyring as second counselor in the first presidency. Those in favor may manifest it. Those opposed, if any, may have manifest it. It is proposed that we sustain Dallin H. Oaks as president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles and M. Russell Ballard as acting president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. Those in favor, please signify. Any opposed may manifest it. It is proposed that we sustain the following as the members of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. M. Russell Ballard, Jeffrey R. Holland, Dieter F. Uchtdorf, David A. Bednar, Quinton L. Cook, R. Todd Christofferson, Neil L. Anderson, Ronald A. Rasband, Gary E. Stevenson, Dale G. Renland, Garrett W. Gong, and Ulysses Suarez. Those in favor, please manifest it. Any opposed may so indicate. It is proposed that we sustain the counselors in the First Presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles as prophets, seers, and revelators. All in favor, please manifest it. Contrary, if there be any, by the same sign. It is proposed that we release with appreciation for their devoted service, Elders Wilford W. Anderson, Kim B. Clark, Lawrence E. Corbridge, Claudia R. M. Costa, Bradley D. Foster, O. Vincent Halleck, Donald L. Hallstrom, Stephen E. Snow, and Larry Y. Wilson as General Authority 70s and grant them emeritus status. Those who wish to join with us in expressing gratitude to these brethren and their families for the remarkable service, please so manifest. It is proposed that we release the following as Area 70s. Julio C. Acosta, Blake R. Alder, Alain L. Allard, Omar A. Alvarez, Teichi Keoba, Carlos F. Arredondo, Ale K. Auna, Jr., Grant C. Bennett, Michael H. Bourne, 
Romulo V. Carrera, Wilson B. Calderon, Hermando Carmago, Jose C. F. Campos, Nicolas Castaneda, Walter Chatora, Zeno Chow, Robert J. Dudfield, J. Kevin Entz, Mediola M. Fata, K. Mark Frost, Claude R. Gamiet, Mauricio C. Gonzaga, Leonard D. Greer, Jose L. Cisagave, Te Gul Young, Seri O. L. Krosnelski, Mylon F. Kuntz, Brian R. Larson, G. Kenneth Lee, Haraldo Lima, W. Jean Pierre Luno, Kumbulani Medlesi, Dale E. Monk, Norman R. Nemro, Utaka Undo, Wolfgang Pilz, Raimundo Pacheco Di Pino, Gennady N. Pavadov, Abraham E. Carroll, Marco A. Rice, Stephen K. Randall, Francisco J. Ruiz de Mendoza, Edwin A. Sexton, Raul H. Spitali, C. Walter Trevino, Isaka A. Tukuafu, Juan A. Ura, Raul S. Villanueva, Leonard Wu, those who wish to join us in expressing appreciation for their excellent service, please manifest it. It is proposed that we sustain the following as new Area 70s. Michael J. Carter, Alfred Kiungu, R. Pepper Murray, Ryan K. Olson, Iatua Tune. Those in favor manifest it. Those opposed, if any, may manifest it. It is proposed that we sustain the other general authorities, Area 70s, and general office of the church as presently constituted. All in favor, please manifest it. Contrary, if there be any, by the same sign. Those who opposed any of the proposals should contact their state president. Brothers and sisters, we are ever grateful for your continued faith and prayers in behalf of the leaders of the church. The choir will now favor us with Sweet is the Work. Following the singing, we will hear from Elder David A. Bednar of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. He will be followed by Elder Reuben V. Ayod of the Seventy. We will then hear from our beloved prophet, President Russell M. Nelson, who will be followed by Elder Quentin L. Cook of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles.
I earnestly pray for the assistance of the Holy Ghost for you and for me as we rejoice and worship together in this session of General Conference. In April of 1976, Elder Boyd K. Packer spoke specifically to the youth of the Church in General Conference. In his classic message entitled, Spiritual Crocodiles, he described how during an assignment in Africa, he observed well-camouflaged crocodiles preying on unsuspecting victims. He then likened the crocodiles to Satan, who preys on unwary youth by camouflaging the deadly nature of sin. I was 23 years old when Elder Packer gave that talk, and Susan and I were anticipating the birth of our first child in just a few days. We were impressed with the content of his message about avoiding sin and the masterful way he used the ordinary behavior of animals to teach an important lesson. Susan and I also have traveled to Africa on many assignments, and we have had opportunities to see the magnificent animals that live on that continent. Remembering the impact of Elder Packer's talk in our lives, we have tried to observe and learn lessons from the behavior of African wildlife. I want to describe the characteristics and tactics of two cheetahs Susan and I watched hunting their prey and relate some of the things we observe to the daily living of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Cheetahs are the fastest land animals on earth and reach running speeds as high as 75 miles an hour. These beautiful animals can accelerate from a standstill position to running as fast as 68 miles per hour in less than three seconds. Cheetahs are predators that sneak up on their prey and sprint a short distance to chase and attack. Susan and I spent almost two hours watching two cheetahs stalking a large group of topis, Africa's most common and widespread antelopes. The tall, dry grass of the African savanna was golden brown and almost totally obscured the predators as they pursued a group of topis. The cheetahs were separated from each other by approximately 100 yards, but worked in tandem. While one cheetah sat upright in the grass and did not move, the other cheetah crouched low to the ground and slowly crept closer to the unsuspecting topis. Then the cheetah that had been sitting upright disappeared in the grass at exactly the same moment that the other cheetah sat upright. This alternating pattern of one cheetah crouching low and creeping forward while the other cheetah sat upright in the grass continued for a long time. The stealthy subtlety of the strategy was intended to distract and deceive the topis and thereby divert their attention away from the approaching danger. Patiently and steadily, the two cheetahs worked as a team to secure their next meal. Positioned between the large group of topis and the approaching cheetahs were several older and stronger topis standing as sentinels on termite mounds. The enhanced view of the grasslands from the small hills enabled these guardian topis to watch for signs of danger. Then, suddenly, as the cheetahs appeared to be within striking distance, the entire group of topis turned and ran away. I do not know if or how the sentinel topis communicated with the larger group, but somehow a warning was given and all the topis moved to a place of safety. And what did the cheetahs do next? Without any delay, the two cheetahs resumed their alternating pattern of one cheetah crouching low and creeping forward while the other cheetah sat upright in the grass. The pattern of pursuit continued. They did not stop. They did not rest or take a break. They were relentless in following their strategy of distraction and diversion. Susan and I watched the cheetahs disappear in the distance, always moving closer and closer to the group of topis. 
That night, Susan and I had a memorable conversation about what we had observed and learned. We also discussed this experience with our children and grandchildren and identified many valuable lessons. I now will describe just three of those lessons. Lesson number one, beware of evil's beguiling disguises. To me, cheetahs are sleek, alluring, and captivating creatures. A cheetah's yellowish tan to grayish white coat with black spots acts as a beautiful disguise that makes these animals almost invisible as they stalk their prey in the African grasslands. In a similar way, spiritually dangerous ideas and actions frequently can appear to be attractive, desirable, or pleasurable. Thus, in our contemporary world, each of us needs to be aware of beguiling bad that pretends to be good. As Isaiah warned, woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. In a paradoxical period when violating the sanctity of human life is heralded as a right and chaos is described as liberty, how blessed we are to live in this latter-day dispensation when restored gospel light can shine brightly in our lives and help us to discern the adversary's dark deceptions and distractions. For they that are wise and have received the truth and have taken the Holy Spirit for their guide and have not been deceived. Verily I say unto you, they shall not be hewn down and cast into the fire, but shall abide the day. Lesson number two, stay awake and be alert. For a topi, a brief moment of carelessness or inattentiveness could invite a swift attack from a cheetah. Likewise, spiritual complacency and casualness make us vulnerable to the advances of the adversary. Spiritual thoughtlessness invites great danger into our lives. Nephi described how in the latter days, Satan would attempt to pacify and lull the children of God into a false sense of carnal security, that they will say, all is well in Zion, Yea, Zion prospereth, all is well. And thus the devil cheateth their souls and leadeth them carefully away down to hell. Constant vigilance is required to counteract complacency and casualness. To be vigilant is the state or action of keeping careful watch for possible danger or difficulties. And keeping watch denotes the act of staying awake to guard and protect. Spiritually speaking, we need to stay awake and be alert to the promptings of the Holy Ghost and to the signals that come from the Lord's watchmen on the towers. Yea, and I also exhort you that ye be watchful unto prayer continually, that ye may not be led away by the temptations of the devil. For behold, he rewardeth you no good thing. Focusing our lives in and on the Savior and his gospel enables us to overcome the tendency of the natural man to be spiritually snoozy and lazy. As we are blessed with eyes to see and ears to hear, the Holy Ghost can increase our capacity to look and listen when we may not typically think we need to look or listen, or when we may not think anything can be seen or heard. Watch, therefore, that ye may be ready. Lesson number three, understand the intent of the enemy. A cheetah is a predator that naturally preys on other animals. All day, every day, a cheetah is a predator. Satan is the enemy of righteousness and of those who seek to do the will of God. All day, every day, his only intent and sole purpose 
are to make the sons and daughters of God miserable like unto himself. The Father's plan of happiness is designed to provide direction for his children, to help them experience enduring joy, and to bring them safely home to him with resurrected, exalted bodies. The devil labors to make the sons and daughters of God confused and unhappy and to hinder their eternal progression. The adversary works relentlessly to attack the elements of the Father's plan he hates the most. Satan does not have a body, and his eternal progress has been halted. Just as water flowing in a riverbed is stopped by a dam, so the adversary's eternal progress is thwarted because he does not have a physical body. Because of his rebellion, Lucifer has denied himself all of the mortal blessings and experiences made possible through a tabernacle of flesh and bones. One of the potent scriptural meanings of the word damned is illustrated in his inability to continue progressing and becoming like our Heavenly Father. Because a physical body is so central to the Father's plan of happiness and our spiritual development, Lucifer seeks to frustrate our progression by tempting us to use our bodies improperly. President Russell M. Nelson has taught that spiritual safety ultimately lies in, quote, never taking the first enticing step toward going where you should not go and doing what you should not do. As human beings, we all have physical appetites necessary for our survival. These appetites are absolutely essential for the perpetuation of life. So what does the adversary do? He attacks us through our appetites. He tempts us to eat things we should not eat, to drink things we should not drink, and to love as we should not love." Close quote. One of the ultimate ironies of eternity is that the adversary who is miserable precisely because he has no physical body invites and entices us to share in his misery through the improper use of our bodies. The very tool he does not have and cannot use is thus the primary target of his attempts to lure us to physical and spiritual destruction. Understanding the intent of an enemy is vital to effective preparation for possible attacks. Precisely because Captain Moroni knew the intention of the Lamanites, he was prepared to meet them at the time of their coming and was victorious. And that same principle and promise applies to each of us. If ye are prepared, ye shall not fear and that ye might escape the power of the enemy. Just as important lessons can be learned by observing the behavior of cheetahs and topis, so each of us should look for the lessons and warnings found in the simple events of everyday life. As we seek for a mind and heart open to receive heavenly direction by the power of the Holy Ghost, then some of the greatest instructions that we can receive and many of the most powerful warnings that can safeguard us will originate in our own ordinary experiences. Powerful parables are contained in both the scriptures and in our daily lives. I have highlighted only three of the many lessons that can be identified in this adventure Susan and I had in Africa. I invite and encourage you to reflect on this episode with the cheetahs and the topis and identify additional lessons for you and your family. Please remember always that your home is the true center of gospel learning and living. As you respond in faith to this invitation, inspired thoughts will come to your mind, spiritual feelings will swell in your heart, and you will recognize actions that should be undertaken or continued so that you can take upon you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand the evil day, having done all 
that ye may be able to stand. I promise that the blessings of effective preparation and spiritual protection will flow into your life as you are watchful unto prayer vigilantly and continually. I testify that pressing forward on the covenant path provides spiritual safety and invites enduring joy into our lives. And I witness that the risen and living Savior will sustain and strengthen us in times both good and bad. Of these truths I testify in the sacred name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 While visiting their homes, one of the questions I frequently like to ask converts is how they and their families learn about the church and how they came to be baptized. It doesn't matter if the person in that moment is an active member or has not attended church for many years, the answer is always the same. With a smile and the countenance glowing, they begin to tell the story of how they were found. In fact, it seems that the story of conversion is always the story of how we are found. Jesus Christ himself is the Lord of all things. He cares for all things. That is surely why he told the three parables that we find in the 15th chapter of Luke, the parable of lost sheep, the lost coin, and finally the prodigal son. All this story has a common denominator. It doesn't matter why they were lost. It doesn't matter even if they were aware they were lost. There reigns supreme feeling of joy that exclaims, rejoice with me for I had found that which was lost. In the end, Nothing is truly lost to him. Allow me to share this, uh, this afternoon with you one of the most precious things to me, the story of how I myself was found. Just before I turned 15, I was invited by my uncle, Manuel Bustos, to spend some time with him and his family here in the United States. That would be a great opportunity for me to learn some English. My uncle had converted to the church many years before, and he had a great missionary spirit. That is probably why my mother, without me knowing, spoke with him and said that she would agree to the invitation on one condition, that he did not try to convince me to become a member of his church. We are Catholics and we have been for generations, and there was no reason to change. My uncle was in complete agreement and kept his word and to the point that he didn't want to answer even simple questions about the church. Of course, what my uncle and his sweet wife, Marjorie, could not avoid was being who they were. I was assigned a room that contained a large library of books. I could see that in that library there were roughly 200 copies of the Book of Mormon in different languages, 20 of them in Spanish. <laughs> One day, out of curiosity, I took down a copy of the Book of Mormon in Spanish. It was one of those copies with a sky blue soft cover with the figure of the angel Moroni in the front. Upon opening it on the first page, uh, there was written the following promise. And when ye shall receive the things, I would exhort you that ye would ask God, the eternal Father, in the name of Christ, if these things are not true. And if ye shall ask with a sincere heart, with real intent, having faith in Christ, he will manifest the truth of it unto you by the power of the Holy Ghost. And then he added, and by the power of the Holy Ghost, you may know the truth of all things. It is difficult to explain the impact this scripture had on my mind and heart. To be honest, I was not looking for the truth. I was just a teenager, happy with his life, enjoying this new culture. Nevertheless, with that promise in mind, I secretly began to read in the book. As I read more, I understood that if I really wanted to get anything from this, I had better start to pray. And we all know what happens when you decide not only to read, but to pray about the Book of Mormon. Well, that just happened to me. It was something so special and so unique, yes, just the same that had happened to millions of others around the world. 
I came to know by the power of the Holy Ghost that the Book of Mormon was true. I then went to my uncle to explain to him what had happened, and I was ready to be baptized. My uncle could not contain his astonishment. He got into his car, drove to the airport, and returned back with a plane ticket to fly back home with a note addressed to my mother that simply stated, I had nothing to do with this. <laughs> In a way, he was right. I had been found directly by the power of the Book of Mormon. There may be many who have been found through wonderful missionaries around the world, in every case through miraculous ways. Or maybe they have been found through friends that God has deliberately placed in their path. It might be even that they have been found by someone from this generation or through one of their ancestors, whatever the case, in order to progress towards a true personal conversion, sooner rather than later, they all must experience and be found by the power of the truth contained in the Book of Mormon. At the same time, they must personally decide to make a serious commitment to God that they will strive to keep his commandments. Upon returning to Buenos Aires, my mother realized that I truly wanted to be baptized. Since I had some, what a rebellious spirit, instead of opposing me, she very wisely to my side, and without even knowing it, she did my baptismal interview herself. Indeed, I believe that her interview was even more in depth than those that our mission is conduct. She told me, if you want to be baptized, I will support you. But first, I'm going to ask you some questions, and I want you to think very hard and uh, answer me honestly. Do you commit to attend church absolutely every Sunday? I told her, yes, of course, I'm going to do that. Do you have any idea how long church is? Yes, I know, I said. She replied, well, if you get baptized, I'm going to make sure that you attend. Then she asked me if I was truly willing to never drink alcohol or smoke. I answered, yes, of course, I'm going to comply with that as well. To which she added, if you get baptized, I'm going to make sure that that is the case. And she proceeded on in that way almost with every commandment. My uncle had called my mother to tell her not to worry, that I would get, uh, get over this soon. Four years later, when I received my mission to serve in the Uruguay Montevideo mission, my mother called my uncle to ask him exactly when I was going to get over all this. <laughs> the truth is that from that time I was baptized, my mother was a happier mother. I came to know but that the Book of Mormon was crucial in the conversion process by experiencing firsthand the promise that a man would get nearer to God by abiding by its precepts. Nephi, Nephi explained the central purpose of the Book of Mormon in this way. For we labor diligently to write, to persuade our children, and also our brethren to believe in Christ, and to be reconciled to God. And so we talk of Christ, we rejoice in Christ, we preach of Christ, and we prophesy of Christ, that our children may know to what source they may look for a remission of their sins. The entire Book of Mormon is imbued with the same sacred purpose. For this reason, many readers who commit to a sincere study of it with the spirit of prayer will not only learn about Christ, but he will learn from Christ, especially if he made the decision to try the virtue of the world and not reject it prematurely due to prejudice and belief by what others have said about things that they have never read. President Russell M. Nelson reflected, when I think of the Book of Mormon, I think of the word power. The truth of the Book of Mormon has the power to heal, comfort, restore, succor, strengthen, console, and cheer our souls." Close quote. My invitation this afternoon to each of us, regardless of how long we've been members of the church, to allow the power of the truth of the Book of Mormon to find us and embrace us once again. And day after day, I will diligently seek for personal revelation. He will do so if we allow it. I solemnly testify that the Book of Mormon contains the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ 
and that the Holy Ghost will confirm the truth of it time after time to anyone who with a sincere heart seeks knowledge unto the salvation of their souls. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Thank you, Elder Alio and Elder Bednar for your messages. Dear brothers and sisters, it's wonderful to be with you again in General Conference. Earlier this week, announcements were made to members of the church about changes in policy regarding who may serve as witnesses to baptism and sealing ordinances. I would like to highlight those three points. One, a proxy baptism for a deceased person may be witnessed by anyone holding a current temple recommend, including a limited use recommend. Two, any endowed member with a current temple recommend may serve as a witness to sealing ordinances, living and proxy. Three, any baptized member of the church may serve as a witness of the baptism of a living person. This change pertains to all baptisms outside the temple. These policy adjustments are procedural. The underlying doctrine and covenants are unchanged. They are equally efficacious in all ordinances. These changes should greatly enhance family participation in these ordinances. I also want to speak with you at this time to introduce adjustments that pertain to our youth and their leaders. You'll remember that I have invited the youth of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints to enlist in the Lord's Youth Battalion to participate in the greatest cause on earth today, the gathering of Israel. I issued this invitation to our youth because they are unusually gifted in reaching out to others and sharing what they believe in a convincing fashion. The cause of the gathering is an essential part of helping to prepare the world and its people for the second coming of the Lord. In each ward, the Lord's Youth Battalion is led by a bishop, a dedicated servant of God. His first and foremost responsibility is to care for the young men and young women of his ward. The bishop and his counselors direct the work of the Aaronic Priesthood Quorums and the young women classes in the ward. The adjustments we will now announce are intended to help young men and young women develop their sacred personal potential. We also want to strengthen Aaronic Priesthood Quorums and young women classes and provide support to bishops and other adult leaders as they serve this rising generation. Elder Quentin L. Cook will now discuss the adjustments that relate to the young men. And tonight, at the general women's session, Sister Bonnie H. Corden, Young Women General President, will discuss the adjustments that relate to the young women. The First Presidency and the Twelve are united in endorsing these efforts to strengthen our youth. Oh, how we love them and pray for them. They are the hope of Israel, Zion's army, children of the promised day. We express our complete confidence in our youth and our gratitude for them. In the sacred name of Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you, dear President Nelson, for that joyful revelatory guidance with respect to witnesses at baptisms and the direction you have asked us to share to help strengthen youth and develop their sacred potential. Before I share those adjustments, we express our sincere appreciation for the exceptional way members have responded to developments in the ongoing restoration of the gospel. As President Nelson suggested last year, you have taken your vitamins. <laughs> you joyfully study Come Follow Me at home. You have also responded to adjustments at church. Members of the Elders Quorum and Relief Society Sisters unitedly do the work of salvation. Our gratitude is overflowing. We are particularly grateful 
that our youth continue to remain strong and faithful. Our youth live in an exciting but also challenging time. The choices available have never been more dr dramatic. One example, the modern smart, smart, smartphone provides access to incredibly important and uplifting information, including family history and the Holy Scriptures. On the other hand, it contains foolishness, immorality, and evil not readily available in the past. To help our youth navigate this maze of choices, the Church has prepared three profound and comprehensive initiatives. First, curriculum has been strengthened and expanded to the home. Second, a children and youth program that includes exciting activities and personal development was presented just last Sunday by President Nelson, President Ballard, and the general officers. A third initiative is organizational changes to make youth a more significant focus of our bishops and other leaders. This focus must be spiritually powerful and help our youth become the youth battalion President Nelson has asked them to become. These efforts, together with those announced during the last few years, are not isolated changes. Each of the adjustments is an integral part of an interlocking pattern to bless the saints and prepare them to meet God. One part of the pattern relates to the rising generation. Our youth are being asked to take more individual responsibility at younger ages without parents and leaders taking over what youth can do for themselves. Today, we announce organizational changes for youth at ward and stake levels. As President Nelson explained, Sister Bonnie H. Corden will discuss changes for young women this evening. One purpose for the changes I will now discuss is to strengthen Aaronic priesthood holders, quorums, and quorum presidencies. These changes align our practice with Doctrine and Covenants, section 107, verse 15, which reads, the bishopric is the presidency of this Aaronic priesthood and holds the keys or authority of the same. One of the scriptural duties of the bishop is to preside over the priests and to sit in council with them, teaching them the duties of their office. In addition, the first counselor in the bishopric will have specific responsibility for teachers and the second counselor for deacons. Accordingly, to align with this revelation in the Doctrine and Covenants, Young men presidencies at the ward level will be discontinued. These faithful brethren have done much good, and we express appreciation to them. It is our hope that bishoprics will give great emphasis and focus to the priesthood responsibilities of young men and help them in their quorum duties. Capable adult young men advisors will be called to assist the Aaronic Priesthood Quorum presidencies and the bishopric in their duties. We are confident that more young men and young women will rise to the challenge and stay on the covenant path with this laser-like focus on our youth. In the Lord's inspired pattern, the bishop has responsibility for everyone in the ward. He blesses the parents of youth as well as the youth. One bishop found that as he counseled with a young man struggling with pornography, he could help the young man in his repentance only as he helped the parents react with love and understanding. The young man's healing was a healing for his family and was possible through the bishop working in behalf of the entire family. The young man has now become a, Mel a worthy Melchizedek priesthood holder and full-time missionary. As this account suggests, these adjustments will help bishops and their counselors focus on their core responsibilities to the youth and primary children. Place the power and duties of the Aaronic Priesthood at the center of every young man's personal life and goals. These adjustments also emphasize the responsibilities of Aaronic Priesthood Quorum Presidencies and their direct reporting line to the bishopric. Motivate adult leaders to assist and mentor Aaronic Priesthood Quorum Presidencies in magnifying the power and authority of their office. As noted, these adjustments do not lessen the bishopric's responsibility for young women. As President Nelson just taught, 
the bishop's first and foremost responsibility is to care for the young men and young women of his ward. How will our beloved and hardworking bishops fulfill this responsibility? As you remember, in 2018, Melchizedek priesthood quorums were adjusted to work even more closely with relief societies so that elders quorums and relief societies can, under the direction of the bishop, help shoulder important responsibilities that previously consumed much of his time. These responsibilities include missionary work and temple and family history work in the ward, as well as much of the ministering to ward members. The bishop cannot delegate some responsibilities, such as the youth, being a common judge, caring for those in need, and overseeing finances and temporal affairs. These are, however, fewer than we may have understood in the past. As Elder Jeffrey R. Holland explained last year when the adjustments to the Melchizedek Priesthood Quorums were announced, the bishop remains, of course, the presiding high priest of the ward. This new alignment of elders quorums and relief societies should let him preside over the work of the Melchizedek Priesthood and the Relief Society without requiring him to do the work of either of those bodies." End quote. For instance, a Relief Society president and an Elders Quorum president, as assigned, can take a greater role in counseling with adults, as can a young woman president in counseling with young women. While only the bishop can serve as a common judge, these other leaders are entitled to revelation from heaven to help with challenges that do not call, require a common judge or involve abuse of any kind. That doesn't mean a young woman cannot or should not talk to the bishop or to her parents. Their focus is the youth. But it does mean that our, a young woman leader may best meet the needs of an individual young woman. The bishopric is as concerned for young women as for young men but we recognize the strength that comes from having strong, engaged, and focused young women leaders who love and mentor, not taking over the role of class presidencies, but helping youth succeed in those roles. Sister Corden will share additional exciting changes for young women tonight. I, however, announce that Ward Young Women presence will now report to, the, to and counsel directly with the Bishop of the Ward. In the past, this assignment could be delegated to a counselor, but going forward, young women will be a direct responsibility of the one who holds presiding keys for the ward. The Relief Society president will continue to report directly to the bishop. At the general and stake levels, we will continue to have young men presences. At the stake level, a high counselor will be the young men president and will with the high counselors assigned to young women in primary be part of the stake Aaronic Priesthood Young Women Committee. These brethren will work with the stake young women presidency on this committee. With the counselor of the stake president as chair, this committee will have increased importance because many of the programs and activities in the new children and youth initiative will be at the stake level. These high counselors, under the direction of the stake presidency, can serve as a resource to the bishop and Aaronic priesthood quorums in a manner similar to the service provided by high counselors toward elders quorums. As a related matter, another high counselor will serve as the stake Sunday school president and, as needed, could serve on the stake Aaronic priesthood young women committee. Additional organization changes will be further explained in information sent to leaders. These changes include the Bishopric Youth Committee meeting will be replaced by a Ward Youth Council. The word mutual will be retired and become young women activities, ironic priesthood quorum activities, or youth activities, and will be held weekly where possible. The word budget for youth activities will be divided equitably between the young men and young women according to the number of youth in each organization. A sufficient amount will be provided for primary activities. At all levels, ward, stake, and general, we will use the term 
organization rather than the term auxiliary. Those who lead the General Relief Society, young women, young men, primary and Sunday school organization will be known as general officers. Those who lead organizations at the ward and stake levels will be known as ward officers and stake officers. The adjustments announced today may begin as soon as branches, wards, districts, and stakes are ready, but should be in place by January 1, 2020. These adjustments, when combined and integrated with previous adjustments, represent a spiritual and organizational effort consistent with doctrine to bless and strengthen every man, woman, youth, and child, helping each to follow the example of our Savior, Jesus Christ, as we progress on the covenant path. Dear brothers and sisters, I promise and testify that these comprehensive adjustments under the direction of an inspired president and prophet, Russell M. Nelson, will empower and strengthen every member of the Church. Our youth will develop greater faith in the Savior, be protected from the temptations of the adversary, and stand prepared to meet life's challenges. In the sacred name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. The congregation will now join the choir in singing Redeemer of Israel. After the singing, we'll be pleased to hear from Brother Mark L. Pace, who was sustained last April as General Sunday School, as Sunday School General President. He will be followed by Elders D. Todd Budge and Jorge M. Alvarado of the 70. This is the 189th semi-annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints.
We rejoice in meeting together in this great general conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. It is a blessing to receive the mind and will of the Lord through the teachings of His prophets and apostles. President Russell M. Nelson is the Lord's living prophet, and how grateful we are for his inspired counsel and direction we have received today. I add my witness to those shared previously. I bear testimony of God, our eternal Father. He lives and loves us and watches over us. His plan of happiness provides for the blessing of this mortal life and our eventual return to His presence. I also bear testimony of Jesus Christ. He is God's only begotten Son. He saved us from death, and He redeems us from sin as we exercise faith in Him and repent. His infinite atoning sacrifice in our behalf brings the blessing of immortality and eternal life. Indeed, God be thanked for the matchless gift of His divine Son. Latter-day Saints around the world are blessed to worship Jesus Christ in His temples. One of those temples is currently under construction in Winnipeg, Canada. My wife Anne Marie and I had the opportunity to visit the construction site in August of this year. The temple is beautifully designed and will certainly be magnificent when completed. However, you can't have a magnificent temple in Winnipeg or anywhere else without a solid and firm foundation. The freeze-thaw cycle and expansive soil conditions in Winnipeg made it challenging to prepare the temple foundation. Therefore, it was determined that the foundation for this temple would consist of 70 steel piles encased in concrete. These piles are 60 feet in length and 12 to 20 inches in diameter. They are driven into the ground until they hit bedrock approximately 50 feet below the surface. In this way, the 70 piles provide a solid, firm foundation for what will be the beautiful Winnipeg Temple. As Latter-day Saints, we seek a similar firm and sure foundation in our lives, a spiritual foundation needed for our journey through mortality and back to our heavenly home. That foundation is established on the bedrock of our conversion to the Lord Jesus Christ. We recall the teachings of Helaman from the Book of Mormon. And now, my sons, remember, remember that it is upon the rock of our Redeemer, who is Christ, the Son of God, that ye must build your foundation, that when the devil shall send forth his mighty winds, yea, his shafts in the whirlwind, it shall have no power over you to drag you down to the gulf of misery and endless woe, because of the rock upon which ye are built, which is a sure foundation, a foundation whereon if men build, they cannot fall. Gratefully, we live in a time when prophets and apostles teach us of the Savior Jesus Christ. Following their counsel helps us establish a firm foundation in Christ. A year ago, in his opening remarks of the 2018 General Conference, President Russell M. Nelson provided this declaration and warning. The long-standing objective of the Church is to assist all members to increase their faith in our Lord Jesus Christ and in His Atonement, to assist them in making and keeping their covenants with God, and to strengthen and seal their families. In this complex world today, this is not easy. The adversary is increasing his attacks on faith and upon us and our families at an exponential rate. To survive spiritually, we need counter-strategies and proactive plans. Following President Nelson's message, Elder Quentin L. Cook of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles introduced the Come Follow Me resource for individuals and families. His remarks included the following statements. The new home study Come Follow Me resource is designed to help members learn the gospel in the home. This resource is for every individual and family in the Church. Our purpose is to balance the Church and the home experience in a way that will greatly increase faith and spirituality and deepen conversion to Heavenly Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Starting in January of this year, Latter-day Saints worldwide begin studying the New Testament with Come Follow Me resource as our guide. With a weekly schedule, Come Follow Me helps us study the scriptures, the doctrine of the gospel, and the teachings of the prophets and apostles. It's a marvelous resource for us all. 
After nine months of this worldwide scripture study effort, what do we see? We see Latter-day Saints everywhere growing in faith and devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ. We see individuals and families setting aside time throughout the week to study the words of our Savior. We see improving gospel instruction in our Sunday classes as we study the scriptures at home and share our insights at church. And we see greater family joy and unity as we have moved from simply reading the scriptures to studying the scriptures in a profound way. It has been my privilege to visit with many Latter-day Saints and hear firsthand of their experiences with Come Follow Me. Their expressions of faith fill my heart with joy. Here are just a few of the comments I have heard from various members of the church in different parts of the world. A father shared, I enjoy Come Follow Me as it provides an opportunity to testify of the Savior to my children. In another home, a child said, this is a chance to hear my parents bear their testimonies. A mother shared, we have been inspired as to how to put God first. The time we thought we didn't have has been filled with hope, joy, peace, and success in ways we didn't know were possible. A couple observed, we are reading the scriptures entirely differently than we have ever read them before. We are learning so much more than we've ever learned before. The Lord is wanting us to see things differently. The Lord is preparing us. A mother remarked, I love that we are learning the same things together. Before we were reading it, today we are learning it. A sister shared this insightful perspective. Before you had the lesson and the scriptures supplemented it, now you have the scriptures and the lesson supplements it. Another sister commented, I feel a difference when I do it compared to when I don't. I find it is easier to talk to others about Jesus Christ and our beliefs. A grandmother remarked, I call my children and grandchildren on Sundays and we share insights from Come Follow Me together. A sister observed, Come Follow Me feels like the Savior is personally ministering to me. It is heaven inspired. And a father commented, when we use Come Follow Me, we are like the children of Israel, marking the side posts of our doors, protecting our families from the influence of the destroyer. Brothers and sisters, it is a joy to visit with you and to hear how your efforts with Come Follow Me are blessing your lives. Thank you for your devotion. Studying the scriptures with Come Follow Me as a guide is strengthening our conversion to Jesus Christ and His gospel. We're not simply trading one hour less in church on Sunday for one hour more of scripture study at home. Learning the gospel is a consistent effort throughout the week. As one sister insightfully shared, the goal is not to make church one hour shorter, it is to make church six days longer. Now consider again, Consider again the warning our prophet, President Nelson, gave as he opened the October 2018 General Conference. The adversary is increasing his attacks on faith and on our, upon us and our families at an exponential rate. To survive spiritually, we need counter strategies and proactive plans. Then, approximately 29 hours later, on Sunday afternoon, he closed the conference with this promise. As you diligently work to remodel your home into a center of gospel learning, the influence of the adversary in your life and in your home will decrease. How can the attacks of the adversary be increasing exponentially while at the same time the influence of the adversary is actually decreasing? It can happen and it is happening throughout the church because the Lord prepares His people against the attacks of the adversary. Come follow me is the Lord's counter strategy and proactive plan. As President Nelson taught, the new home-centered, church-supported, integrated curriculum has the potential to unleash the powers of families. However, it does and will require our best efforts. We need to follow through conscientiously and carefully to transform our home into a sanctuary of faith. After all, as President Nelson also said, we are each responsible for our individual growth. With the Come Follow Me resource, the Lord is preparing us for the perilous times that we now face. 
He is helping us establish that sure foundation, a foundation whereon if men build, they cannot fall. The foundation of a testimony anchored firmly in the bedrock of our conversion to the Lord Jesus Christ. May our daily efforts in studying the scriptures fortify us and prove us worthy of these promised blessings. I so pray in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Our son Daniel got very sick on his mission in Africa and was taken to a medical facility with limited resources. As we read his first letter to us after his illness, we expected that he would be discouraged, but instead he wrote, even as I lay in the emergency room, I felt peace. I have never been so consistently and resiliently happy in my life. As my wife and I read these words, we were overcome with emotion consistently and resiliently happy. We had never heard happiness described that way, but his words rang true. We knew that the happiness he described was not simply pleasure or an elevated mood, but a peace and joy that comes when we surrender ourselves to God and put our trust in him in all things. We too had had those times in our lives when God spoke peace to our souls and caused us to have hope in Christ, even when life was hard and uncertain. Lehi teaches that if Adam and Eve had not fallen, they would have remained in a state of innocence, having no joy, for they knew no misery. But behold, all things have been done in the wisdom of him who knoweth all things. Adam fell that men might be, and men are that they might have joy. In a paradoxical way, afflictions and sorrow prepare us to experience joy if we will trust in the Lord and his plan for us. This truth is beautifully expressed by a 13th century poet. Sorrow prepares you for joy. It violently sweeps everything out of your house so that new joy can find space to enter. It shakes the yellow leaves from the bow of your heart so that fresh green leaves can grow in their place. It pulls up the rotten roots so that new roots hidden beneath have room to grow. Whatever sorrow shakes from your heart, far better things will take their place. President Russell M. Nelson taught, the joy the Savior offers us is constant, assuring us that our affliction shall be but a small moment and be consecrated to our gain." End quote. Our trials and afflictions can make space for greater joy. The good news of the gospel is not the promise of a life free of sorrow and tribulation, but a life full of purpose and meaning, a life where our sorrows and afflictions can be swallowed up in the joy of Christ. The Savior declared, In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. His gospel is a message of hope. Sorrow coupled with hope in Jesus Christ holds the promise of enduring joy. The account of the Jaredites' journey to the Promised Land can be used as a metaphor for our journey through mortality. The Lord promised the brother of Jared and his people that he would go before them into a land which is choice above all the lands of the earth. He commanded them to build barges, and they obediently went to work building them according to the Lord's instructions. However, as the work progressed, the brother of Jared de de developed concerns that the Lord's design for the barges was not sufficient. He cried out, O Lord, I have performed the work which thou hast commanded me, and I have made the barges according as thou hast directed me, and behold, O Lord, in them there is no light. O Lord, wilt thou suffer that we shall cross this great water in darkness? Have you ever poured out your soul to God in such a way? When striving to live as the Lord commands and righteous expectations are not met, have you ever wondered if you must go through this life in darkness? The brother of Jared then expressed an even greater concern about their, about their ability to survive in the barges. He cried, And also we shall perish, for in them we cannot breathe, save it is the air which is in them. Have the difficulties of life ever made it hard for you to breathe? and caused you to wonder how you can make it through the day 
let alone make it back to your heavenly home? After the Lord worked with the brother of Jared to resolve each of his concerns, he then explained, Ye cannot cross this great deep, save I prepare a way for you. Against the waves of the sea and the winds which have gone forth and the floods which shall come. The Lord made it clear that ultimately the Jaredites could not make it to the promised land without him. They were not in control. And the only way they could make it across the great deep was to put their trust in him. These experiences in tutoring from the Lord seemed to deepen the brother of Jared's faith and strengthen his trust in the Lord. Notice how his prayers changed from questions and concerns to expressions of faith and trust. I know, O Lord, that thou hast all power and can do whatsoever thou wilt for the benefit of man. Behold, O Lord, thou canst do this. We know that thou art able to show forth great power, which looks small unto the understanding of men. It is recorded that the Jaredites then got aboard of their barges and set forth into the sea, commending themselves unto the Lord their God. To commend means to entrust or to surrender. The Jaredites did not get into the barges because they knew exactly how things would work on their journey. They got aboard because they had learned to trust in the Lord's power, goodness, and mercy. And they were therefore willing to surrender themselves and any doubts or fears they have, may have had to the Lord. Recently, our grandson Abe was afraid to ride one of the carousel animals that move up and down. He preferred one that didn't move. His grandmother finally persuaded him that it would be safe, so trusting her, he got aboard. He then said with a big smile, I don't feel safe, but I am. <laughs> Perhaps that is how the Jaredites felt. Trusting God may not always feel safe at first, but joy follows. The journey was not easy for the Jaredites. They were many times buried in the depths of the sea because of the mountain waves which broke upon them. Yet it is recorded that the wind did never cease to blow them towards the promised land. As difficult as it is to understand, especially at the times in our lives when the headwinds are strong and the seas are turbulent, we can take comfort in knowing that God in his infinite goodness is always blowing us towards home. The record continues. They were driven forth, and no monster of the sea could break them, neither well that could mar them, and they did have light continually, whether it was above the water or under the water. We live in a world where the monster waves of death, physical and mental illness, and trials and afflictions of every kind break upon us. Yet through faith in Jesus Christ and choosing to trust in him, we too can have light continually, whether above the water or under the water. We can have the assurance that God never does cease to blow us towards our heavenly home. While being tossed about in the barges, the Jaredites did sing praises unto the Lord, and they did thank and praise the Lord all the day long. And when the night came, they did not cease to praise the Lord. They felt joy and thanksgiving even in the midst of their afflictions. They had not yet arrived in the promised land, yet they were rejoicing in the promised blessing because of their consistent and resilient trust in him. The Jaredites were driven forth upon the water 344 days. Can you imagine that? Trusting in the Lord includes trusting in his timing and requires patience and endurance that outlasts the storms of life. Ultimately, the Jaredites did land upon the shore of the Promised Land. And when they had set their feet upon the shores of the Promised Land, they bowed themselves down upon the face of the land and did humble themselves before the Lord and did shed tears of joy before the Lord because of the multitude of his tender mercies over them. If we are faithful in keeping our covenants, we too will one day arrive safely home and will bow before the Lord and shed tears of joy for the multitude of his tender mercies in our lives, including the sorrows that made space 
for more joy. I testify that as we commend ourselves unto the Lord and consistently and resiliently trust in Jesus Christ and his divine purposes in our lives, that he will visit us with assurances, speak peace to our souls, and cause us to hope for our deliverance in him. I witness that Jesus is the Christ. He is the source of all joy. His grace is sufficient, and he is mighty to save. He is the light, the life, and the hope of the world. He will not let us perish. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. When I was a child, a member of the church offered to help my family fly from Puerto Rico to Salt Lake so we could be sealed in the temple, but soon obstacles began to appear. One of my sisters, Maribid, became ill. Unsettled, my parents prayed about what to do and still felt prompted to make the journey. They trusted that as they follow up the promptings of the Lord, our family will be washed over and blessed, and we were. No matter the obstacles we face in life, we can trust that Jesus Christ will prepare a way forward as we walk with faith. God has promised that all who live according to the covenant they have made with him will in his time receive all his promised blessings. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland taught, some blessings come soon, come late, and some don't come into heaven. But for those who embrace the gospel of Jesus Christ, they come. Moroni taught, that faith is thing which are hoped for and not seen. Wherefore, dispute not because you see not, for you receive no witness until the trial of your faith. The question is, what should we do to best meet the trials that come our way? In the first public remark as president of the church, President Russell M. Nelson taught, as a new presidency, we want to begin with the end in mind. For this reason, we're speaking to you today from a temple. The end for which each of us strive is to be endowed with power in the house of the Lord. Seal as families, faithful to covenants made in the temple that qualify us for the greatest gifts of God, that of eternal life. The ordinances of the temple and the covenants you make there are key to strengthening your life, your marriage and family, and your ability to resist the attack of the adversary. Your worship in the temple and your service there for you and your ancestors who will bless you would increase personal revelation and peace and will fortify your commitment to stay on the covenant path. As we follow God's voice and his covenant path, he will strengthen us in our trials. My family trip to the temple years ago was difficult. But as we approached the temple in Salt Lake City, Utah, my mother, full of joy and faith, said, we are going to be okay. The Lord will protect us. We were sealed as a family. My sister recovered. And all this happened, happened only after the trial of my parents' faith and following the promptings of the, of the Lord. This example of my, of my parents still influence our lives today. Their example taught us the why of the gospel doctrine and helped us understand the meaning, purpose, and blessings that the gospel brings. Understanding the why of the gospel of Jesus Christ can also help us face our trials with faith. Ultimately, Everything God invites us and commands us to do is the expression of his love for us and his desire to give us the blessings reserved for the faithful. We cannot assume that our children will learn to love the gospel on their own. It is our responsibility to teach them. As we help our children learn how to use their agency wisely, our example can inspire them to make their own right choices. Their faithful living will in turn help their children to know the truth of the gospel for themselves. Young man and young woman, hear the prophet today talking to you. Seek to learn divine truth and seek to understand 
the gospel for yourself. President Nelson recently counseled, what wisdom do you lack? Follow the example of the prophet Joseph. Find a quiet place, humble yourself before God. Pour out your heart to your heavenly father. Turn to him for answers. As you seek guidance from your loving heavenly father, listen to the counsel of living prophets and watching the example of righteous parents, you too can become a strong link of faith in your family. <laughs> to parents with children who have left the covenant path, gently go back, help them comprehend the gospel truth. Start now, it's never too late. Our example of righteous living can make a great difference. President Nelson taught, as Latter-day Saints, we have become accustomed to think of church as something that happened in our meeting houses, supported with what happened at home. We need to adjust to this pattern. It is time for a home-centered church, supported with what takes place inside our branch, war, and state buildings. A story is told of a woman who was upset that her son was eating too much candy. No matter how much she told him to stop, he continued to satisfy his sweet tooth. Totally frustrated, she decided to take her son to see a wise man who he respected. She approached him and said, Sir, my son eats too much candy. Would you please tell him to stop eating it? He listened carefully, then said to her, Go home. To the son, come, go home and come back in two weeks. She took her son, went home, perplexed why he had not asked the boy to stop eating so much candy. Two weeks later, they returned. The wise man looked directly to the boy and said, Boy, you should stop eating so much candy. It is not good for your health. The boy nodded and promised he would. The mother asked, Why did you tell him? That two weeks ago, the wise man smiled. Two weeks ago, I was still eating too much candy myself. <laughs> this man lived with such integrity that he knew his advice will only or will carry power only if he has followed his own counsel. The influence we have in our children is more powerful as they see us walking faithfully on the covenant path. The Book of Mormon prophet Jacob is an example of such righteousness. His son Enos wrote of the impact of his father's teachings. I, Enos, knowing my father that he was a just man, for he taught me in his language and also in the nature of ammunition of the Lord, and blessed be the name of my God for it. And the words which I have often heard my father speaking concerning eternal life and the joy of the saint sunk deep into my heart. The mothers of the streaming warriors lived the gospel and their children were filled with conviction. The leader reported they had been taught by their mothers that if they did not doubt, God will deliver them. And they rehearsed into me the words of their mother saying, we did not doubt our mothers knew it. Enos and the stripling warriors were strengthened by the faith of their parents, which helped them meet their own trials of faith. We are blessed with the restored gospel of Jesus Christ in our days, which lift us when we feel discouraged or trouble. We are assured that our efforts will bear fruit in the Lord's undue time if we press forward to the trials of our faith. My wife and I, with the area presidency, recently accompanied Elder David A. Bettner to the dedication of the Haiti Port of Prince Temple. Our son Jorge, who came with us, said about his experience, amazing, Papa. As soon as Elder Bettner started with the dedicatory prayer, I could feel the room filled with warmth and light. The prayer added so much to my understanding of the purpose of the temple. It is really the house of the Lord. In the Book of Mormon, Nephi teaches that as we desire to know the will of God, he will strengthen us. He wrote, I, Nephi, being exceedingly young and also having great desires to know of the mysteries of God, wherefore I did cry unto the Lord, and behold, he did visit me. 
and I dissolved to my heart that I did believe all the words which has been spoken by my father. Wherefore, I did not rebel against him like unto my brothers. Brothers and sisters, let us help our children and all around us to follow God's covenant path so that the Spirit might teach them so soften their hearts to desire to follow him through their life. As I consider the example of my parents, I realize that our faith will show us the way back to our heavenly home. I know miracles come after the trial of our faith. I bear testimony of Jesus Christ and his atoning sacrifice. I know he is our savior and deliverer. He is and our heavenly father came that morning of the spring of 1820 to John Joseph Smith, the prophet of the restoration. President Russell M. Nelson is the prophet of our day. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. We are grateful for all who have spoken to us this afternoon and for the beautiful music that has been provided and for the inspired organizational changes that have been announced. We remind the primary girls, young women, and Relief Society sisters of the women's session, which will commence in the conference center this evening at 6 p.m. Mountain Daylight Time. The nationwide broadcast of music and the spoken word may be viewed tomorrow morning from 9.30 to 10 a.m. Mountain Daylight Time. The Sunday morning session of conference will immediately follow. The concluding speaker for this session will be Elder Ronald A. Rasband of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. Following his remarks, the choir will close this meeting by singing Thy Spirit, Lord, has stirred our souls. The benediction will then be offered by Elder Craig C. Christensen of the Seventy. Dear brothers and sisters, as we close this session, may we each hold in our hearts the witness born today of the truths of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are blessed to have this sacred time together to reinforce our promise to the Lord Jesus Christ that we are his servants and he is our savior. The importance of making and keeping promises and covenants weighs heavy on my mind. How important is it to you to keep your word? to be trusted, to do what you say you will do, to strive to honor your sacred covenants, to have integrity. By living true to our promises to the Lord and to others, we walk the covenant path back to our Father in heaven and we feel his love in our lives. Our Savior Jesus Christ is our great exemplar when it comes to making and keeping promises and covenants. He came to earth promising to do the will of the Father. He taught gospel principles in word and in deed. He atoned for our sins that we might live again. He has honored every one of his promises. Can the same be said of each of us? What are the dangers if we cheat a little, slip a little, or do not quite follow through with our commitments? What if we walk away from our covenants? Will others come unto Christ in light of our example? Is your word your bond? Keeping promises is not a habit. It is a characteristic of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. Ever mindful of our frailties in mortal life, the Lord promised, be of good cheer. And do not fear, for I, the Lord, am with you and will stand by you. I have felt his presence when needing reassurance, comfort, greater spiritual insight or strength. And I have been deeply humbled and am grateful for his divine companionship. The Lord has said, 
every soul who forsaketh his sins and cometh unto me and calleth on my name and obeyeth my voice and keepeth my commandments shall see my face and know that I am. That is perhaps his ultimate promise. I learned the importance of keeping my word in my youth. One such example is when I stood at attention to recite the Scout Oath. Our association with the Boy Scouts of America, as it now concludes, will always be an important legacy to me and this church. To the scouting organization, to the scores of men and women who have served diligently as scout leaders, to the moms, real credit goes there, you know, and to the young men who have participated in scouting, we say thank you. In this very session, our dear prophet, President Nelson, and Elder Cook have announced adjustments that will refocus our attention on youth and align our organizations with revealed truth. In addition, just last Sunday, President Nelson and President Ballard explained the new children and youth of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints program for the entire church. It is a worldwide initiative focused on our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The First Presidency and Quorum of the Twelve Apostles are unified in this new direction, and I personally bear my witness that the Lord had, has guided us every step of the way. I am excited for the children and youth of the Church to experience this integrated focus on them both at home and at Church through gospel learning, service and activities, and personal development. The youth theme for this coming year, 2020, speaks of Nephi's classic promise to go and do. He wrote, And it came to pass that I, Nephi, said unto my father, I will go and do the things which the Lord hath commanded, for I know that the Lord giveth no commandments unto the children of men, save he shall prepare a way for them that they may accomplish the thing which he commandeth them. Although uttered long ago, we in the Church stand on that promise today. To go and do means rising above the ways of the world, receiving and acting on personal revelation, living righteously with hope and faith in the future, making and keeping covenants to follow Jesus Christ, and thereby increasing our love for Him, the Savior of the world. A covenant is a two-way promise between us and the Lord. As members of the Church, we covenant at baptism to take upon us the name of Jesus Christ, to live as He lived. Like those baptized at the waters of Mormon, we covenant to become His people, to bear one another's burdens that they may be light, to mourn with those that mourn, comfort those that stand in need of comfort, and to stand as witnesses of God at all times and in all things and in all places. Our ministering one to another in the Church reflects our commitment to honor those very promises. When we partake of the sacrament, we renew that covenant to take upon us His name and make additional promises to improve. Our daily thoughts and actions both large and small, reflect our commitment to Him. His sacred promise in return is, If ye do always remember me, ye shall have my Spirit to be with you. My question today is, do we stand by our promises and covenants, or are they sometimes half-hearted commitments, casually made and hence easily broken? When we say to someone, I will pray for you, do we? When we commit, I will be there to help, will we? When we obligate ourselves to pay a debt, do we? When we raise our hands to sustain a fellow member in a new calling, which means give support, do we? 
One evening in my youth, my mother sat with me at the foot of her bed and spoke fervently of the importance of living the word of wisdom. I know from the experiences of others from years ago, she said, the loss of spirituality and sensitivity that comes from not following the word of wisdom. She looked right into my eyes, and I felt her words penetrate my heart. Promise me, Ronnie, today, she called me Ronnie, that you will always live the word of wisdom. I solemnly made that promise to her, and I have held to it all these years. That commitment served me well when I was in my youth, and in later, later years when I was in business circles where substances flowed freely. I made a decision in advance to follow God's laws, and I never had to revisit it. The Lord has said, I am bound. I, the Lord, am bound when ye do what I say. But when ye do not what I say, ye have no promise. What is he saying to those who abide by the word of wisdom? That we will have the promise of health, strength, wisdom, knowledge, and angels to protect us. Some years ago, Sister Rasband and I were at the Salt Lake Temple for the sealing of one of our daughters. As we stood outside the temple with a younger daughter, not yet old enough to attend the ceremony, we spoke of the importance of being sealed in the holy temple of God. As my mother had taught me years before, we said to our daughter, we want you safely sealed in the temple, and we want you to promise us that when you find your eternal companion, you will make a date with him to be sealed in the temple. She gave us her word. She has since stated that our talk and her promise protected her and reminded her what was most important. She later made sacred covenants as she was sealed to her husband in the temple. President Nelson has taught, we increase the Savior's power in our lives when we make sacred covenants and keep those covenants with precision. Our covenants bind us to him and give us godly power. When we keep promises to one another, we are more likely to keep promises to the Lord. Remember the Lord's words, inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Reflect with me on examples of promises in the scriptures. Ammon and the sons of Mosiah in the Book of Mormon committed to preach the word of God. When Ammon was captured by Lamanite forces, he was taken before the Lamanite king Lamoni. He committed to the king, I will be thy servant. When raiders came to steal the king's sheep, Ammon cut off their arms. So astonished was the king, he listened to Ammon's message of the gospel and was converted. Ruth in the Old Testament promised her mother-in-law, Whither thou goest, I will go. She lived true to her word. The Good Samaritan in a parable in the New Testament promised the innkeeper he would care for the injured traveler. Whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Zoram in the Book of Mormon promised to go into the wilderness with Nephi and his brothers. Nephi recounted, When Zoram had made an oath unto us, our fears did cease concerning him. What of the ancient promise made to the fathers, as described in the scriptures, that the hearts of the children shall turn to their fathers. In the pre-earth life when we chose God's plan, we made a promise to help gather Israel on both sides of the veil. Quote, we went into a partnership with the Lord, Elder John A. Widso explained years later. The working out of the plan became then not merely the Father's work, 
and the Savior's work, but also our work, end quote. The gathering is the most important thing taking place on the earth today, President Nelson has said, as he has traveled throughout the world. When we speak of the gathering, we are simply saying this fundamental truth. Every one of our Heavenly Father's children on both sides of the veil deserves to hear the message of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ." End quote. As an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, I conclude with an invitation and promise. First, the invitation. I invite you to consider the promises and covenants you make with the Lord and with others with great integrity, knowing that your word is your bond. Second, I promise you, as you do this, the Lord will establish your words and sanction your deeds as you strive with unwearied diligence to build up your lives, your families, and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He will be with you, my dear brothers and sisters, and you can with confidence look forward to being received into heaven, that thereby you may dwell with God in a state of never-ending happiness, for the Lord God hath spoken it. Of this I testify and promise in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.
our eternal Father in heaven. We love thee, Father, and we are grateful for the opportunity to feel and to learn and to hear the messages of this session of conference. We're grateful for the testimonies of the Savior, thy Son, and our Redeemer, and we love him. We particularly recognize, Father, the great battalion of youth of this church and the messages shared this day that will bless their lives as they bless others. We recognize their valiance, their dedication, their faith, and their desires. We recognize their parents and pray blessings upon each one of them, their leaders who have been highlighted today, that their bishops and those that serve with them will will nurture this great spiritual potential of the battalion that goes out to help gather scattered Israel. We're grateful for thy son and for the promised blessings of his second coming. May we be ever focused on our own preparation, spirituality, and dedication. Please bless all of us, Father, that we will follow prophets, seers, and revelators. And we're grateful for President Nelson and his leadership and vision done under the inspiration of heaven. These blessings, Father, we express our thanks for recognizing thy hand in everything that is good in our life, and do so in the name of Jesus Christ, thy Son. Amen. This has been a broadcast of the 189th Semi-Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Speakers were selected from the general authorities and general officers of the church. The music for this session was provided by a combined choir of individuals residing in stakes in the Provo, Utah area. This broadcast has been furnished as a public service by Bonneville Distribution. Any reproduction, recording, transcription, or other use of this program without written consent is prohibited.